Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show for another unsponsored independent review. But today, something a little different as we have a comparative review. And today, it's two absolutely cracking everyday automatic watches, both under $500 from two highly prestigious brands. Now, before we get started, please remember to hit like on this video to help support the channel and keep it independent. And now, let's get into it. I have to say a special thank you to official AD for Seiko, uh, Mark at Long Island Watch for lending this in. This is a new for 2021, the Seiko SRPG27. And then of course, an old favorite returns from official Hamilton AD Moya. So a massive thank you to them as well. Both are on my list of the most professional trusted watch dealers that I personally buy from and would highly recommend. I only ever recommend the very best for my audience. Um, oh, and I should really do a quick wristwatch check before we get into it. This is the Dan Henry 1962. I tend to be wearing this one a lot. Uh, it's because I think I'm kind of yearning for a speed master and wearing this helps me keep that uh, large expense at bay. Uh, on the pearl on from Risk Candy Watch Club, of course. What's interesting about both watches we are looking at today is that they share their genesis with World War II. However, their evolution and how they were utilized is dramatically different. The Hamilton is a pretty straightforward story that was long before its Swiss takeover, when it was still American and based in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. During the interwar period, Hamilton focused on consumer pocket watches and supplying 56% of timepieces used in the US railroad market. This also evolved into wristwatches, and then when World War II did break out, production of consumer watches was completely stopped, with all wristwatch manufacturing being shipped to the troops. The result was staggering. Over 1 million watches were sent overseas, not just to US troops, but allied forces too. With Seiko, the ancestors of this watch can be traced back to World War II as well, but unlike the industrial might of the USA, less quantities due to Japan's lack of resources. Provisions of timepieces dwindled towards the end of the conflict, especially as Japan began to lose the war, making these watches very rare and little is actually known about them. Initially, the Imperial Army ordered large numbers of the watch based on one simple design, but designated for different branches of the armed forces. They were differentiated by either having an anchor for the Navy, a star for the Army, or a cherry blossom logo for the Air Force on the dial. The Air Force model also featured a radium hands and dial for better visibility during night flights. Towards the end of the war, the Army stopped ordering them completely, and apparently, soldiers and their families had to buy them with their own money. With very limited resources by this time, priority was diverted to producing the infamous Seikosha Tensoku, or rather morbidly nicknamed the Kamikaze watches. These were converted from pocket watches, making them cheaper to produce and more reliable. With their massively 48mm size, they were also easier for the pilot to read in a Mitsubishi cockpit while wearing goggles. So as always, we'll start with dimensions. Uh, as there's two uh, watches, I'll save a bit of time and I'll just put it on the screen. And then also you can see the differences between them a bit more clearly. The weight is about 66 grams for the Hamilton, which of course is on this leather strap, so a lot lighter. And I have to say the, the Seiko is really heavy um, at 148 grams, which is quite substantial on the full uh, bracelet, although obviously if you take some links out, it will be less. Uh, and I should also mention as we're talking about straps and bracelets, both are available on straps and bracelet versions. In terms of materials, we have domed sapphire uh, on the Hamilton, uh, entirely stainless steel, of course, and then a very thickly bolstered stitched leather uh, for the strap and a corresponding signed buckle, also in stainless steel. Uh, for the Seiko, we have their famed Hardlex in a super, super domed version this time. Um, I wasn't expecting it to be so domed, as you can see there. 
uh, hard legs for the crystal, then all stainless steel and stainless steel bracelet. The bracelet has a double push button deployant with a fold over there, signed, nothing really to write home about with the two uh, little micro adjustments there. Well, first of all, the water resistance is exactly the same on each 100 meters, which is just fantastic for everyday use. In terms of their automatic movements, uh, we'll start, well, you know what, let's start with the Hamilton. Uh, this is the H10, which has twice the power reserve of the Seiko there, because of course, um, being part of the Swatch group, they basically introduced the same thing what they did with the previously reviewed, um, uh, what was it, the T, oh yeah, the Tissot, Powermatic 80 where they tweaked an ETA in order to cut costs. They made it more modular uh, So it's cheaper to replace um, They did they just replace entire sections rather than you know employing a watchmaker to sit there for hours So it's based on an ETA 2824 uh, they slowed down the speed, which of course reduces friction, wear and tear, and uh, introduced the more efficient spring barrel. The frequency is from 4 hertz to 3 hertz, which incidentally is the same as uh, the Seiko. There is the 4R36, which was introduced in 2011, basically an upgrade of the popular and rock solid 7S26. You know, you get the magic lever, all the, the bi-directional winding, all the, the things that it made um, the 7S26, just so trusted and reliable, rock, rock solid, as you guys know. Uh, but of course, uh, this new update, we finally get hacking and manual wind, which of course, uh, all of them do have. Oh, and I should also mention quick set as well. As you can see right there, the advantage of the Seiko is that we get the day complication as well as the date there at the three o'clock. I'll just push it back in and off it goes. So while you've got the uh, the power reserve on this, you've got an extra complication than that. Which is more useful to you? Um, it's up for you to decide, uh, I guess. Um, the only thing I will say about the Hamilton is that you do get that fantastic, you know, wear it for the week, take it off on Friday for something else on the weekend, you know, because this is a great everyday watch. And then it's still ticking on a Monday morning. Don't panic about this, guys, that uh, out of the factory, it's plus 45 to minus 35. I know a lot of you are gonna be absolutely appalled, but, but guys, it's hardly ever that. Um, I've found most Seikos never to be that inaccurate. Um, to be honest, this is performing almost within COSC, uh, as is the Hamilton. So in terms of accuracy, really, there's not that much difference between them. One thing that the Hamilton has got over the Seiko is, of course, date change, which is just a characteristic of these um, cheaper movements from Seiko. It takes, you know, two hours, whereas this um, is a snappy, you know, at 12 o'clock, it just clicks over because that's an inherent trait of the ETA. Uh, something I really do like about the Hamilton is the oversized crown. It's so ergonomic. It's really wonderful to wind, really easy to grip. Uh, look, there's nothing wrong with the Seiko crown. It's just, it's just, it's just so comfortable. Just being able to pull out the crown easily, wind it, set it, uh, is an absolute pleasure and never really noticed how nifty it was until well until you got something to compare it to which i guess is an advantage of these comparative reviews now the last thing about performance is of course the luminescence but i'm going to discuss that a little bit later on the inspirations of each watch differs greatly the Seiko is an evolved mix of several quite eclectic models, but perhaps most notably the World War II all-purpose military watches we discussed before. This is the first time Seiko used 24-hour markings on the dial that most often define field watches, but technically this is not actually a true field watch as many erroneously claim it is, as its progenitors served land, sea and air. Then sometime in the 90s, the Seiko 5 SNK 809 was introduced to the civilian market. This curious but lovable mix of undersized field watch and pilot style dial was a nod to the brand's long forgotten heritage of genre mixing military watches from the war. This was followed shortly by its bigger brother, the SNZG13. The SRPG27 we are looking at today is a revamped new 2021 update of the SNZG collection and part of the brand's newly and constantly updated Seiko 5 line that started being replenished a few years ago. 
And this explains the new uh, printed Superman style Seiko 5 logo over the heraldic shield applied logo of before that we now see on the finely grained matte black dial. We also get applied silver 12 hour numerals. And unlike the hour hand of the SMZG, it's now segmented to help differentiate between the two index style handset. With the Hamilton, the lineage of making watches for the military can be traced as far back as World War I, most notably their marine chronometers for the US Navy. Interestingly, the brand's use of 24-hour markings goes back even further with some extremely rare pocket watches for the civilian market, featuring them adjacent to the larger 12-hour numerals, a style that has now become synonymous with field watches for obvious reasons. The watch we are looking at today is more noticeably inspired by the mil-spec watches from the pre- and post-Vietnam War era, like the GGW113 for example. Unlike their World War II field watches, these manual wind true military watches always had 24-hour markings as directly specified. The H7045533 and Khaki collection as a whole was introduced shortly after the Swatch takeover, intended as a more refined, affordable, straightforward everyday watch, but also offered alongside the more historically faithful mechanical manual wind versions that we also have reviewed. Unlike the Seiko, it is still a true field watch and is even named as such. While the case-shaped dial layout, syringe hands and numeral style are all clearly taken from the 60s to 80s era, the oversized crown harkens back to their World War II field watches. Unlike their strictly utilitarian ancestors, the subtle refinement is quite extensive. There's that charming dash of cherry red on the arrow of the second hand that reaches out nicely to the more complex and ultra-precise 60-minute scale at the periphery of the dial. The 12 hour numeral section is also elegantly finished with a guilloche concentric grooves to separate it from the inner 24 hour markings. The crown is also signed with the 60s retro H logo. Finally, by making it automatic and giving it a date complication, just like the Seiko, it simply makes it a very compelling, practical, do it all watch, but still with the inherent battlefield trusted legibility. Hamilton's main advantage is the Swiss-made status, which could or could not mean something to you, but it does carry a cachet worldwide. The brand's scale of military watchmaking is undeniably impressive and goes back further than Seiko. It's also important to note Hamilton's deep heritage and connection to US history and pop culture for that matter, being founded as far back as 1892. Despite it being part of the Swatch Empire now, it was for a longer period American than it was actually Swiss. The brand also boasts many innovations like the 1957 world's first electric watch, the Hamilton Electric 500, which was also famously worn by Elvis Presley. However, Hamilton pales in comparison to the watch world changing behemoth, that is Seiko. Few brands can compete in terms of achievements. From a brand that is still completely in-house manufactured and run by actual descendants of its founder. Few brands have had as much of an impact as Seiko. Even Hamilton, is not safe from the ravages of the quartz crisis. It had to be rescued by Swatch as a result. While Hamilton may have been in over 400 movies, Seiko has been in everything from computer games to James Bond's wrist and even worn in space. It offers everything from super high end to some of the most affordable watches on the market. While Hamilton is predominantly entry to mid-level watches only. Having said that, there is still, outside of Japan, a stigma attached to the Seiko brand commonly only dismissed as just affordable watches by those not really into horology. When it comes to quality, it's pretty much an open and shut case. Uh, the Hamilton is way higher um, on a different level of finishing. I mean, the edges, uh, super, super sharp, very nice feeling. Uh, they they really do a good job. I've, I've never been disappointed by uh, a Hamilton. Here, the Swiss-made uh, reputation is definitely uh, delivered and lived up to. And if you look at the polishing, if, if I just show you, look at the, the high polish on the side of that compared to the high polishing. Uh, it probably won't translate into the camera, but look at the bezel, right? Uh, it's a much higher mirror-like finish, uh, whereas this is a, uh, you know, it's not bad at all, but that's a telltale sign. The quality of polishing 
far superior on the Hamilton. Brushed sections are about the same, that's not very difficult to do. Uh, it takes a lot less effort, obviously. Look at the edges, I mean, there's a stark difference. Um, maybe maybe it's just a tactile thing, but uh, take my word for it, the, uh, the Hamilton is on a much higher level. Having said that, I could not find any QC issues with the Seiko, they're famous. <laughs> Uh, quality control or lack thereof I should say but I guess that's because it's a very simple watch relatively speaking there's no rotating bezels there's no chapter ring to misalign uh, everything here was was executed perfectly in terms of value well you know if I pull in the uh, the famous uh, SNK 809 there the days of buying a watch like this under $100 are definitely over uh, for Seiko. This brings it more onto the Hamilton uh, level. Okay, this is just over $100 cheaper. This before did not compete against that. Is it worth paying the extra for the Hamilton? I actually think it is. The quality and what you get for the money is definitely worth that extra 100 or roughly $100 gap. It's also worthy to note um, that you can also, if you want to get a day date, you can get the Khaki King for not much more which is a very similar design to this, uh, which I've also previously reviewed, made famous by the British actor and comedian Hugh Laurie, of course. In terms of negatives, it's a real shame they didn't add spring bar holes uh, like they did on the Seiko because these monochromatic, well, largely monochromatic watches are absolute strap months, especially with this kind of design. Uh, I'm glad they did on the Seiko. That is definitely one strength it has because, I mean, this works with everything. NATOs, fabric straps, leather straps, as you see, bracelets, uh, rubber, you name it, certified strap monsters, undoubtedly. The next big negative is probably for this, uh, the Seiko here. The loom is very, very disappointing. While it is Lumi Bright, it seems to last longer than the Super Luminova on the Hamilton. It's so diminutive and with poor orientation because, I mean, okay, the 12 o'clock has the triangle to differentiate, but it's just not that efficient. The decision to have these applied numerals instead of the loom like uh, like on the Hamilton. Also for me, the silver gray print to match in the numerals makes no sense. Um, it should be crisp white for extra legibility. Maybe call me old fashioned, but sacrificing legibility for, for the sake of it looking good doesn't make much sense to me. Just loses so much uh, functionality. Having said that, I do like the fact they bothered to loom the arrow hand on the Seiko, uh, which is a nice little touch. Next big negative, uh, for, and this very much is a question of taste. I like the combination of high polished on the bezel and then brushed for the case, it will almost entirely brushed on the Hamilton over the polished sides and uh, brushed bezel. I think it just doesn't work as well uh, like it does on the Hamilton. This, this gives me Explorer vibes, which of course the Explorer is one of my favorite watches. I think it's a fitting departure from the entirely satin brushed cases of the mill spec watches because obviously there's no concern of it reflecting light and revealing your location um, outside of a military context of course. The bracelet I'm not a fan of. Uh, if you looked at the bracelet on the uh, SN, I forget it what it is, the SNG ZG that this replaces, that had way more micro adjustments. The end links are not solid, still very rudimentary pin uh, kind of a bit of an afterthought, not a fan of the uh, the strap whatsoever, I mean the bracelet whatsoever. But the big negative for me on the Seiko has got to be that ridiculous height. I mean, it's almost as tall as a, <laughs> as a chronograph. The hard lex is just way too exaggerated to pronounce. So I have no issue with the uh, almost 40 millimeter diameter. It's just that it's so tall, it feels chunky and clumsy. Okay, so you look at the SNK, this has the predecessor movement, which is a smidgen smaller, okay, less jewels, a few more wheels, etc. But it's less than a millimeter slimmer than the newer movement, right? There's no need for this movement to be housed in such a chunky case. It makes a huge difference to how it wears. I mean, after having this on the wrist, you rarely feel it. 
One could also criticize the Hamilton as being a little bit limited. I do like the fact that the new Seikos, they've come out with nine different variations, all kinds of colors, different finishes, uh, some really interesting dials with blues and greens and what have you. I'd love to see more variation from Hamilton, uh, maybe even a gold tone one, who knows? Uh, I'd love to see a blue dial uh, with this design. Um, I know they have expanded their mechanical, the, the hand, manual wind ones, uh, which I am very interested in. The, um, the blacked out one, I think that is sexy as hell. Battling myself not to buy that at the moment. Lastly, the biggest negative of the Hamilton is the fact that it's difficult to regulate these movements because they've introduced this new modular design to the uh, DTAs. So it doesn't have the conventional regulator. For me, I like to regulate my own watches. Um, so if you like me, it's gonna be a bit tricky. It's not impossible, it's just a bit tricky. And I did criticize the Tissot, which of course is under the Swatch umbrella as well, uh, with the Powermatic 80. Whereas obviously on the Seiko, you've got the traditional regulator there. For me, the winner here is undoubtedly the Hami. It's any situation wearability, perfect, comfortable scale, clean, functional design that works with almost any sartorial style and top quality for the money is difficult to beat. I can't help feeling disappointed by the Seiko. Sure, it's a nice watch, but for me, not a fully realized watch and feels like a missed opportunity. I typically come away from reviewing a Seiko wanting to buy it. This is perhaps the first Seiko I have liked the least. However, both do a good job of being a balance of their Thule, unpretentious military roots, elevated into something more for every day. But for me, the Hamilton does it better. It gets my pure class seal of approval. If you're looking for a solid automatic, well-made, do-it-all watch for under $500, then this is undoubtedly it. Okay guys, I'm gonna leave it there. Thank you very, very much for watching. Please don't forget to like this video, very important indeed. Uh, let me know your thoughts on these two watches. What do you appreciate about them? Uh, what would you have changed? And also nominations for future reviews. Uh, please do share all of that good stuff in the comments. Thank you so much for watching, and I will catch you in the next one. Okay, ciao.